Record two, ballet, harmony squared. It's spring, from the on the green wall, from the wild plains out of sight in the distance, the wind is carrying the honeyed yellowed pollen of some flower. This is, this sweet pollen dries the lips. You keep running your tongue over them and every woman you meet and every man too, of course, must have these sweet lips. This somewhat interferes with logical thought. And then what a sky, blue, unsullied by a single cloud. What primitive tastes these ancients must have had if their poets were inspired by those absurd, untidy clumps of mist. Ide idiotically jostling one another about. I love, and I am sure that I am right in saying we love, only such a sky as this one today, sterile and immaculate. On days like this, the whole world seems to have been cast of the same immovable and everlasting glass as the green wall, as all of our structures. On days like this, you can see into the deep blue depth of things. You see their hitherto unsuspected, astonishing equations. You see this in the most ordinary and the most everyday things. Here, take for instance, just this morning, I was at the hang hangar where the integral is being built and suddenly I caught sight of the equipment. The regulator globes, their eyes closed, oblivious were twirling around. The cranks were glistening, glistening and bending to the left and right. The balance beam was proudly heaving its shoulders. The bit of the router was squatting athletically to the beat of some unheard music. I suddenly saw the whole beauty of this grandiose mechanical ballet, flooded with the light of the lovely blue-eyed sun. But why, my thoughts continued, why beautiful? Why is the dance beautiful? Answer, because it is non-free movement. Because all the fundamental significance of the dance lies precisely in its aesthetic subjugation, its ideal non-freedom. And if it is true that our ancestors gave themselves over to dancing at the most inspired moments of their lives, religious mysteries, military parades, that can mean only one thing, that from time immemorial, the instinct of non-freedom has been the orga an organic part of man, and that we, in our present day life, are only deliberately... I'll have to finish this later. The intercom screen just clicked. I lift my eyes. 090, of course. In half a minute, she'll be here herself coming to get me for a walk. Dear O, oh, it always struck me that she looks like her name about 10 centimeters shorter than the maternal norm, and therefore sort of rounded all over, the pink O of her mouth open to greet every word I say, and also she has a sort of circular, puffy crease at her waist, the way children have. When she came in, my logical flywheel was still humming away inside me, and the inertia carried me on to start talking about the formula I'd just come up with, the one containing us and the machines and the dance. Wonderful, isn't it? I asked. Yes, wonderful. It's spring. O90 smiled at me rosily. There, how's that for you? Spring. She's right away on spring. Women. I didn't say a word. We went down. The avenue was jammed. When the weather's like this, we usually take an extra walk during the personal hour after lunch. As usual, all the pipes of the music factory were singing the one state march. The numbers were marching along and stepped in neat ranks of four, hundreds and thousands of them in their sky-blue unis, with the golden badge on each chest bearing each one's state number. And I, or rather we, our four, were one of the innumerable waves in that mighty flood. To my left was O90. If one of my hirsute ancestors from a thousand years back were writing this, he'd probably modify her with that funny word, my. On my right were two numbers I didn't know, a female and a male. Blessedly blue sky, little baby suns on each badge, faces undimmed by anything so crazy as thought. Rays, you see. Everything made out of some kind of uniform, radiant, smiling matter. And the beat of the brass, tra-ta-ta, tra-ta-ta. Brass paces gleaming in the sun, 
and every pace carries you up higher and higher into the dizzying blue. And then, just the way it was this morning in the hangar, I saw again as though right then, for the first time in my life, I saw everything. The unalterably straight streets, the sparkling glass of the sidewalks, the divine parallel pipeheads of the transparent dwellings, the squared harmony of our gray-blue ranks. And so I felt that I, not generations of people, but I myself, I had conquered the old God and the old life. I myself had created all this. And I'm like a tower. I'm afraid to move my elbow for fear of shattering the walls, the cupolas, the machines. And then there came a moment, a leap across centuries from plus to minus. I recalled association by contrast, apparently. I suddenly recalled a picture in the museum, one of the avenues they had back then after 20 centuries, a stunningly garish, mixed-up crush of people. Wheels, animals, posters, trees, colors, birds. And they say it really was like that. It could have been like that. It all struck me as so unlikely, so idiotic, that I couldn't help it. I burst out laughing. And suddenly there was an echo of laughter from the right I turned. And suddenly there was a, an echo of laughter from the right. I turned. Before my eyes were teeth, white, uncommonly white, sharp teeth, and a woman's face that I didn't know. I'm sorry, she said, but the way you were looking at everything, it was inspired. Like you were some god out of like you were some god out of myth on the seventh day of creation. I think you believe you created me too. You and nobody else. I'm very flattered. All this with a straight face. I'd even say with a kind of respect. Maybe she knows I'm the builder of the integral. But I don't know. Something about her eyes or brows, some kind of odd, irritating X that I couldn't get at at all. A thing I couldn't express in numbers. For some reason, this embarrassed and slightly confused me. For some reason, this embarrassed and slightly confused me and I started trying to make up some logical explanation for why I was laughing. It was perfectly clear that this contrast, this unbridgeable gulf between today and back then, unbridgeable, but why? What white teeth? You, you could build a little bridge across the gulf. Just imagine, a drum, battalion, ranks. They used to have all that, too. So it follows that. Well, yes, that's right, I shouted. This was an amazing example of mental crossover. She said almost in my very words exactly what I'd been writing before going to walk. You see? Even thoughts. That's because no one is one, but only one of. We're so identical. She said, are you sure? I saw the sharp angle her brows made when she lifted them toward her temples. Like the sharp horns of an X. And for some reason I got confused again. I looked to the right, to the left, and she was to my right. Slender, sharp, tough, and springy as a whip. I-330, three, three, now I saw her number. To my left was O, completely different, everything about her round with the babyish crease on her arm. And at the end of our group of four was a male number that I didn't know, was a male number that I didn't know. He bent in two places, like the, like the letter S. We were all different. That one on the right, I-330, three, three, I must have, noti must have noticed my confused look. Yes. Too bad, she said with a sigh. That too bad was absolutely called for. No doubt about it. But again, there was something in her face or her voice. So I said very abruptly, which isn't like me at all, nothing's too bad. Science is going forward, and it's clear that maybe not right away, but in 50 or 100 years. Even those noses, even the noses on everybody. Yes, the noses! I was practically shouting. Once there's some, never mind what reason for envy, once I have a button nose and someone else has. Well, now if it comes to that, your nose is even rather classical, she said, as they used to say in the old days. But for as... 
But as for your hands, no, come on now, show me, show me your hands. I can't stand people looking at my hands. They're hairy, shaggy, some kind of stupid throwback. I stuck my hands, I stuck out my hands and said with a steady, as steady a voice as I could manage, a monkey's hands. She looked at my hands and then my face. Yes, there's an extraordinarily curious harmony. She weighed me with her eyes as if I were on a scales and her brows once more looked like horns. He's assigned to me, said 090, her mouth smiling rosily. It would have been better if she'd not said anything, of, of course. That was completely besides the point. Besides that dear O, how should I put this? Her tongue isn't set at the right speed. The MPs, motions per second, of the tongue must always be a little less than the MPs of thought, and never the other way around. At the end of the avenue, the clock on the accumulator tower was booming out 1700. The personal hour was over. I-330 was walking away with that S-shaped male number. His face was the kind that inspires a sort of respect, and I now saw that it was even a rather familiar face. I'd met him somewhere. I just can't recall now. In parting, I-330 smiled at me in the same X-like way and said, Drop by to see me day after tomorrow in Auditorium 112. I shrugged and said, if I get the order for the auditorium you mention. Why was she so sure of herself? I couldn't see, but she said, you'll get it. This woman was just as irritating to me as an irrational term that accidentally creeps into your equation and can't be factored out. I was glad to be alone with my dear O, even if not for long. We went hand in hand across four lines of avenues. At the corner, she was to go right. I left. I'd like so much to come to your place today and let the blinds down. Today, right this minute, said O, and shyly looked up at me with her round crystal blue eyes. She's a funny one, but what could I say? She was with me only yesterday. She knows as well as I that our next sex day is the day after tomorrow. It's just more of her thought getting ahead of itself, like a spark that fires too early in the ignition, which can do some harm at times. Saying goodbye, I kissed her twice. No, I'll tell you the truth. Three times on those wonderful blue eyes of hers that not the least little cloud ever troubled. 